threatened with bladed weapons, rubber boats rammed and punctured, firearms stolen, and a Filipino soldier severely injured. These were the scenes from that fateful June 17 confrontation between the China Coast Guard and the Philippine Navy at Ayungin Shoal. And now the AFP wants China to pay literally. So we are demanding that uh, China pay 60 million pesos for the damage that they caused. We are also looking into the possibility of charging them with the cost of uh, restructuring the, the, the hand of uh, CSN1 Pakundo. Kasi mag-ooperahan po siya eh. Ooperahan para, para bumalik yung function ng kanyang kamay. I illegal acts kasi itong mga ginawa nila na ito eh. So dapat uh, managot sila. So, dapat panugutan nila. In US dollars, that's a little over a million. Browner said this figure covers just damage to the property and does not include the medical costs of seaman first class underwater operator Jeffrey Facundo, who was the one who lost a finger during the altercation. He also said he demanded the return of seven firearms in a letter course through Defense Secretary Gibo Teodoro. Browner spoke at Camp Pagnaldo today, where President Marcos led the command conference of the armed forces, in line with his duties as Commander-in-Chief of the military. There, the president was briefed on the country's plan of action to address ongoing tensions in the disputed waters. We have presented to our president several options that uh, the armed forces of the Philippines will be doing, not just in terms of uh, performing our RORE operations, but including the other operations in the West Philippine Sea. Browner refused to divulge the details of the next rotation and resupply or RORE mission, but suggested that if there was another run-in, they will not shy away from using force as well. Under the rules of engagement, a person has the right to defend himself you know, in uh, any manner. We will uh, apply the same level of force that would uh, allow us to defend ourselves. For instance, kung gumamit po siya ng kuchilyo, gagamit rin tayo ng kuchilyo. No? Hindi po yung lalabis. Uh, nung sinabi kong lalaban tayo, ang ibig ko sabihin po doon ay hindi natin haayaan na basta na lang uh, uh, ibuli tayo ng ganon. No? In the next uh, Rore, ay, uh, basta hindi po tayo papayag na basta na lang no? apihin. Browner also noted that the military is hardening its bases against possible missile attacks by China. Senator Aimee Marcos had previously said she received information that China was planning to use hypersonic missiles to hit 25 targets in the Philippines, including military bases that host EDCA sites. But Browner assured the public that there's no reason to panic as this information hasn't been verified. Ako po mismo hindi ko nakita yung uh, sinasabing report na yan or even the locations of these 25 targets. In a text message to News 5, National Security Council Assistant Director General Jonathan Malaya also said they weren't aware of any of the security threats she mentioned, but they will reach out to Senator Aimee nonetheless. Malaya went on to say that the Philippines and the People's Republic of China maintain cordial relations and that they are committed to managing whatever differences there may be. With that, Malaya says they see no threat of any imminent attack from Beijing. Manila and Beijing have just concluded the ninth bilateral consultation mechanism held in Manila this week, where both sides committed to find ways to de-escalate tensions in disputed waters. Both sides also talk about possible cooperation between their coast guards and scientists. Browner said at today's command conference, President Marcos gave them a clear directive. The instruction po ng ating Pangulo is to de-escalate. De the objective really, maski po kami, is uh, to prevent war. For News 5, Brian Castillo, we are One News. As tensions cool down at Ayungin Shoal, things are heating up in the Taiwan Straits. Chinese officials boarded and seized a Taiwanese boat, which had five crew members on board Tuesday night for what it said was due to illegal fishing. The boat was apparently intercepted near the Kinmen Archipelago, which lies just 12 miles off China's coast and is in China's territorial waters, but is controlled by Taiwan. A spokesperson for China's Coast Guard said the boat violated a fishing moratorium, which runs from May to August, and that it was using nets finer than allowed by Chinese law. Taiwan continues to call on Beijing to release the boat and to not use political factors to handle the situation.
The Coast Guard calls on the mainland side not to use political factors to handle this situation. Please clarify the reasons as soon as possible and release the boat and the people. The five detained crew were composed of two Taiwanese and three Indonesians. China claims self-governing Taiwan as its territory and says the island must eventually come under its control. Tensions have risen with the election earlier this year of Taiwanese President William Lai ching te whose party rejects reunification. The White House says they're closely monitoring the situation. Okay, here to share his insights on the ongoing conflict at sea. We have with us live in the studio maritime law expert attorney Jay Batongbakal. He is a director uh, the U at the UP Institute of Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea. Good evening, Professor. Thanks for coming all the way here. Good evening, good evening. Well, it took a while, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, not, well not, let's not talk about traffic. Let's talk about traffic at sea. Yeah. Uh, let me circle back to that first story that we ran about uh, the AFP demanding mm -hmm. 60 million pesos in damages yes. from China over property damage mm -hmm. during the June 17 confrontation. We're not even talking about medical costs for that wounded yes, yes, Navy yes. seaman. How much of a legal basis do you think this would have? Well, the Philippines has very solid legal basis to claim compensation because really China, what, the, what China did uh, violates international law in so many different ways. So the country is therefore, that country is therefore internationally responsible or liable for its actions. First, it, uh, by doing so, it, it violated the sovereign immunity of the vessel. It is, after all, a Philippine Navy ship. Still, it, no matter how small it is, it has that sovereign immunity and is considered to be part of uh, the country. It represents the country, essentially. So the fact that they attacked it in that way uh, violated the sovereign immunity of the vessel. Second, uh, there was really no justification for what they did. Uh, the crew, the vessel, was not doing anything to them. So it was an, clearly an unprovoked attack, and it is attack uh, attended uh, with violence. So it is contrary to the principles of the UN Charter. It's an, it's an act uh, or use of force against a sovereign nation because, as I said, the vessel represents uh, the Philippines. So no matter how you look at it, no, uh, China is internationally responsible for that unprovoked uh, action. So, so, so they should pay. Yeah. So there's strong legal basis for it, but who adjudicates in this instance? How will yeah. we get that compensation? Well, it's not a matter of adjudication. It really now is uh, falls to the diplomacy. You know? And I suspect that this was probably one of the items that was uh, touched upon in the bilateral consultation meeting that they had they held the, the, uh, what, the other day and yesterday, I think. Okay, um, what about the uh, reaction and the handling of the Philippines after the June 17 incident? I just wanted to, we haven't spoken in a while, mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your thoughts on how you think the Philippine government handled that. Well, I think, uh, of course, it could have been better, but then it seems like the Philippine government right now is also in a kind of transition with respect to the uh, agencies handling it uh, and the uh, decision making for it. No? So I think it's pretty clear that there, it's in that uh, period, so maybe it's attributable to that. Hey, some would say that sending a Navy force to the resupply mission mm -hmm. uh, is an escalation on our part. I mean, uh, because we could have sent our Coast Guard to mm -hmm. do its routine resupply, mm -hmm. but in the June 17 incident, we saw Navy SEALs mm -hmm. out there. No, I don't think it's an escalation because, you know, the color of the vessel and the markings on it is not what uh, uh, creates any tension. Clearly here, it's the activities of a vessel and its crew, uh, which is uh, the one that can be for a form of escalation. And we have not done anything like that. In fact, as we saw, there are only two uh, rubber boats, uh, basically, uh, that reached the Sierra Madre. They were already moored at the, uh, the side of Sierra Madre, and they weren't taking any kind of aggressive actions against anyone. So it's not because they were they were navy vessels that it is uh, that it can be considered aggressive, and we have to uh, we shouldn't forget the BRP Sierra Madre itself is a navy vessel. So it's only right that it be resupplied and attended to by a military or navy or uh, marine crew. No? So that is not a sound uh, reason, I think, and it distracts from the fact that all this time it really has been the other side that has been really incrementally escalating no? mm -hmm. from just a few ships to now tens or 20 ships basically against uh, maybe a few of ours no? uh, and all those actions like using a laser and now here using uh, knives and epic access of all things. Do you think it's just coincident that, a coincidence then attorney that it came just a couple of days after you know we did file the continental shelf claim the extension 
I think so. I think so because uh, well, the filing of the continental shelf claim that has been uh, that was recommended so many times before. Mm -hmm. I mean, even during the last uh, months of the Aquino administration, it was uh, again reiterated, and then we did it again with the Duterte administration. So, and again with the Marcos administration. It so happens that this time it was approved. So, I don't think that there's any. Um, relationship between the timing of those uh, events. Can you help us understand uh, the, the concept of the continental shelf? Because we always have the mm -hmm. territorial sea, EEZ, mm -hmm. and now we are hearing an, an extended continental mm -hmm. shelf uh, claim by the Philippines. What does this What does this give us exactly? Yeah. And well, why do we need to mm -hmm. claim this extended okay. continental shelf? Uh, first of all, it's an extension of the continental shelf. The continental shelf is basically about a claim to the natural resources of the seabed. Mm -hmm. It is not equivalent to a claim of sovereignty. Full and absolute sovereignty is basically unlimited power of the state over an area. Mm -hmm. But outside of uh, that area of sovereignty, meaning outside of the territorial sea, what we have are sovereign rights. And sovereign rights are basically property rights. Mm -hmm. What it means is that everything, uh, all the natural resources within that 200 miles first, uh, belongs to us so it's the natural resources it's it's like you know any ordinary person does not ha need to have all of his personal property his car his books etc they don't have to be in his house for him to have control over it or to have rights over it and exercise uh, his property rights over it so it's the same thing here except that here we're talking about natural resources and international law basically grants the philippines those rights sovereign rights which are exactly property rights to any resources found in that area mm -hmm. of the continental mm -hmm. shelf. Initially, if you don't do anything, you're fully entitled to 200 nautical miles. Everything within 200 nautical miles is ours. But based on UNCLOS, it is possible for you to claim additional resources mm -hmm. in an extended continental shelf. So that's what we've done. We're also claiming rights to additional res seabed resources beyond 200 nautical miles, and they happen to fall uh, all within uh, the, the middle area of the South China Sea. But there are issues to this, chief of which is that Malaysia has mm -hmm. protested mm -hmm. the claim saying yes. that part of it encroaches on the Sabah territory. Yes. Well, it was expected. I mean, when we prepared the claim as part of the team, uh, we knew that there will be protests from all these other countries mm -hmm. because necessarily all the surrounding states do have uh, entitlements to the middle part of the South China Sea, the seabed, under the rules. And it's up to them to divide it amongst themselves. So what so, we've done uh -huh. is simply clarified the extent to which we can claim. Um, Vietnam and Malaysia already did so back in 2009, and we already protested them before. So kumbaga ngayon, patas lang. We're all, mm. We've all made claims, we've all protested each other. And, but now that we're clear about the areas which we're claiming, no, we've drawn lines, we can now proceed to the next step, actually, of uh, having serious discussions about how do we divide this between us. So basically, uh, sa madaling salita, Professor, we did this and uh, filed this claim so that all everybody else's cards are on the table, yes. including ours, yes. and then we can proceed to properly. So kumbaga, it does actually help diplomacy yes. Yes. and talks and negotiations. Yes, because it's now more mm -hmm. concrete what it is that we're talking about. It will be easier to negotiate an area when, when you know exactly what, mm. where the boundaries mm -hmm. are, where the overlaps are, are. Are coastal states the ones only entitled to an extended continental shelf? Yes, if they can prove that the seabed, either the shape of the seabed or the geology of the rocks of the seabed are of a certain, have certain characteristics which allow them to extend beyond 200 miles. When you say that you're prepared for Malaysia to protest, mm -hmm. what does that mean? You worked in the filing, you worked in a counter uh, response? Uh, yes, in, yes. In anticipation because of their the, protest? Yes, because the standards for sort of uh, figuring out no, uh, up to where your claim uh, extends, those are all technical. So our mapping agencies can easily do the numbers and, and uh, calculate where our claim will extend, where theirs will. Attorney, and also, they already you? filed their claims, and so we knew that it would overlap on theirs. Can we just clarify, though, that uh, this has not like some sort of prerequisite or early work so that we can try to reclaim Saba again? So it has nothing to do uh, with no, that? No, no. Uh, because uh, all these claims basically uh, are projected from the land territory. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you, it doesn't go in reverse. Uh, the fact that you divide up the shelf area does not necessarily mean anything to the land territory. Okay. And, well, in fact, what, what can be done is that uh, since there are pending sovereignty claims, it's still possible for the three claimant countries here 
to enter into joint uh, exploration and development agreements over the overlapping mm -hmm. claim. That mm -hmm. is also allowed by international law. Yeah. I, was reading, I, was, I was reading her tweets and it says uh, basically it was measured from the shoreline of mm -hmm. uh, Borneo or mm -hmm. Sabah. Uh, a part of how it. Does that, a part of it. So mm -hmm. how, how does that work and can we just clarify like how does the measurement work and how, exactly how much time and mm -hmm. effort does it take to measure those geological features like you mm -hmm. were saying underwater like that's probably really deep under mm -hmm. yeah. is it expensive well it is expensive because you have to do the surveys of the seabed mm -hmm. uh, the minimum required is this, the exact shape and that requires uh, surveys for this projects actually we did both uh, Benham Rice and um, West Palawan region mm -hmm. this the, the research for this was done by Ram Namria uh, between 2007 and 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So they did a lot of surveys. And then um, after all the surveys, that was the most expensive part because it's, it's a ship going back mm -hmm. and forth with all the you know, crew and, and supplies and all the instrumentation. And then from around 2008, 2000, yeah, 2008 uh, the team had been convened to now use the data that was acquired and process it and do all the computations, etc. Uh, 2009, we finished the Benham Rice uh, submission. We had decided to do that first because it was uncontroversial. There were no other mm -hmm. claimants. And we successfully uh, defended the claim uh, before the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. So they validated our findings in 2012. So the next part, the, the uh, claim for West Palau region, the draft had already been prepared. So we just finished the draft and then again recommended to the uh, to the, the three administrations uh, kept recommending it that it be filed no uh, but it was fine it was when the current administration uh, approved it that we then set out to finalize the actual uh, su submission no? mm -hmm. the data and, and the, the write-up was already done the uh, analysis was already done and all the information was already collected so it, it was really more a matter of, of tweaking uh, especially the executive summary, which is now uh, available. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, what should we wait for? I mean, we filed the claim. Mm -hmm. Is this like the 2016 arbitral uh, mm -hmm. uh, award that was given to us? Are we going to wait for something like that? Mm -hmm. Or uh, this is just a point for discussion and negotiation? No, it's more the second part because uh, the CLCS is not an adjudicating body. Mm -hmm. And if a submission is disputed, the policy is to set it aside and let the parties settle it first mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's only the states which can actually settle disputes and the CLCS has no power to do that. To do that. So we knew that as well. Uh, and so what this, what this does is open up uh, the table again for negotiations between the Southeast Asian claimants, especially because they're the ones that have the valid claims. So it's basically setting up parameters for further negotiations yes. and settlements yes. between concerned countries. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, I want to come back to our top story about the damages that the Philippines, that the mm -hmm. EFP is asking China to pay. We mm -hmm. now have a response from the Chinese side, mm -hmm. fresh mm -hmm. off the presses. Uh, this is from Chinese spokesperson Mao Ning. She says the Philippine vessels were carrying out an illegal mm -hmm. resupply mm -hmm. mission which violated China's territorial waters and staging a provocation. Sick. There's a bit of a grammatical error there. And staging a provocation when stopped by China Coast Guard who acted lawfully and rightfully to defend China's sovereignty. The Philippine side should face the consequences of its own action. That is her response to the mm -hmm. AFP saying they mm -hmm. are seeking 60 million pesos or a million dollars in damages. Mm -hmm. Not surprising, think? since they <laughs> think that we're under them. Mm. <laughs> and they think they can uh, uh, charge us like, uh, you know, uh, make us uh, um, liable for actions that they took against us. So, so we're not going to get anything. Yeah. In short, probably uh, as you said, this, this comes I mean, down to the course, diplomacy. It, yes, it comes down to diplomacy because, in the end, uh, China also has to consider that you know what it did, mm -hmm. and the, the whole world knows it, and then see mm -hmm. uh, these videos, etc. No? Uh, and it has implications about you know what 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 are its implications to China's reputation and its sincerity in engaging in any kind of activity out there at sea. What is what does that imply for China and whether it respects the sovereign immunity of other states? No? So if it's smart, if it's smart, then it should consider this and possibly pay compensation as a way of uh, precisely de-escalating 
and also re-establishing good relations with the Philippines. Don't you think that was the route already uh, in the recent uh, BCM, bilateral consultation mechanism, or was that just routine? I mean, this being held twice a year mm -hmm. since 2016, uh, well, what did you read in, in, in the statements of both China and the Philippines? Yeah. Are we headed somewhere with this bilateral mm -hmm. meeting? Well, I think based on the statements, as vague as they are, at least they're not the same as the other statements from previous where, where they just kept recycling and moving and shuffling phrases around. Uh, I think that at least from this recent BCM, it seems that both parties really are interested in finding ways to move away from this brink that they've reached no? because what we've seen is really that uh, china is now using force against the philippines but when you study and the two statements attorney mm -hmm. the, the china would say that the f still say in their mm -hmm. official statement from the bcm that we did infringe on their territory and we uh, provoked them mm -hmm. and uh, at the same time they will say that you know we do respect each other's stance mm -hmm. so it's also a bit uh, contradictory there's well, some elements of uh, that go against each other in there. That is the Chinese diplomatic language. So <laughs> it's always like that. Okay. No, so uh, no surprises there. But I think uh, what we need to look at now is basically the actions of, of China after this. No? Um, it, it is indeed hard because you also have like, you know, uh, the mouthpieces of China, and the, mm -hmm. uh, the that, that's the one that, that really pollutes the air and the atmosphere. Um, but. Uh, and you can expect, of course, that China will not immediately change the phraseology or the attitude of their MOFA spokesperson. Those are really designed no, to, to put up this show of, of absolute strength and confidence, etc. So what we need to look at basically will be facts on the ground and mm. actions on the ground. Uh, if, if it changes, then perhaps that is a better indicator of uh, sincerity on their part. There are two schools of thought as to whether the June 17 incident should have invoked the Mutual Defense Treaty. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, obviously, the uh, Malacanang sought mm -hmm. to try to downplay it, uh, first with Executive Secretary Lucas Persamin saying it was a misunderstanding mm -hmm. and an accident, but later on corrected by Defense Secretary mm -hmm. Gibo Teodora saying it wasn't, it was a deliberate attack, mm -hmm. uh, but still falling short of invoking the MDT. Mm -hmm. On the other side of it, you have the analysts saying like this should have mm -hmm. triggered it given that the Article 3 or 4 mm -hmm. of the MDT says that when you trigger it, it doesn't mean that yeah. America is sending its warship immediately yeah. to come fight with us. It means you mm -hmm. start a process of consultation mm -hmm. between the U.S. and the Philippines to discuss how to yeah. respond to these incidents. Where do you stand? Uh, I stand on the fur... No, no. No, I'm not sure which side you're, but Somewhere basically, in the middle. yeah, no, no, no. Basically, okay, uh, it falls down to what you mean by triggering the MDT, okay? Because for me, there's no need to trigger the MDT. It's as if the, the MDT is like a light switch you turn mm. on and off, and that's not the correct understanding of how it works. The MDT there is active. Uh, it has been used. It's the whole reason why we have Balikatan exercises in ERCA. No, I mean, the MDT does not need to be triggered. What people usually think of when you say trigger the MDT is that uh, when you invoke it, hostilities will now begin, mm. war will mm. begin. Correct. That one, I don't think that that is the intention. Um, we have actually used the MDT because immediately after the incident, there are already close uh, discussions between the Philippines and the United States through their, through their ambassador. So that has actually been uh, already used and activated, and I think they were still uh, discussing it uh, even up to now. No? So, so it's, it's not that. No? I think what people uh, should understand is that uh, you know, when a use of armed force, you know, an unlawful use of force is uh, undertaken as against a state, what should be the appropriate response? Is it full-scale hostilities or war, uh, invoking self-defense or collective self-defense under the UN Charter? I think that in this instance, even international law would not, uh, would not agree with using that single incident you know, serious as it may be, having resulted in a loss of a finger, that is not enough to initiate a full-scale war between two countries. No? Uh, even in international law, there's, there's, there are standards uh, of uh, proportionality and reasonability to, to consider. The response should be proportional. Um, and 
you know, war over the loss of finger is not but, simply not going to be. But if nothing else, it sends a signal. It sends mm -hmm. a message to China, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Washington keeps talking about how they have an ironclad mm -hmm. commitment to the Philippines, mm -hmm. but have yet to show much for it. Yeah, but the pr the proper the, what, what would be the proportional response to the loss of finger? Are we going to ask them for another finger <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in return? So Actually, it's not, I was, it doesn't work that way. I was going to say there was a third school of thought where mm. I was just reading an article earlier today, and the fact that our our officials are always in constant communication, those phone calls, right, mm -hmm. between the peers, between the, somewhere, someone in the defense establishment here and there, may, may it be the Secretary of Defense here and the mm -hmm. Secretary of Defense there, that's already Article 3 of the MDD. Yes. So basically, that's also kind of how you see things, yes. Yes. that we are actually we are invoking actually, it already. Yes, we're mm -hmm. actually using it. Uh, and that's why we have to distinguish between, you know, the misunderstanding that triggering the MDT means we're going to start hostilities mm. and basically triggering the MDT in the sense that, okay, we're going to make use of mechanisms in the MDT. Mm. And in the MDT, there are several possible mechanisms, including consultations, to talk about what uh, responses could be made jointly with, uh, through the alliance. And this can be um, um, actions like economic, diplomatic, etc. So, um, for example, if we were to decide that in order to respond to this kind of incident, uh, both the Philippines and the U.S. should now call on their friends and allies in the world to discredit this Coast Guard, remove its accreditation, no, and call them out for being a maritime danger agency instead of a safety agency, then that would be a proportional response, okay. I think. Uh, the Philippine government has already said that they will not be afraid to uh, self-defend themselves mm -hmm. in the next resupply mission. Mm -hmm. Use um, the same level of force. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taking a look at the June 17 incident, mm -hmm. what would be the proportionate response mm -hmm. in terms of self-defense there? Well, uh, again, um, if we if we go by, for example, the standards for maritime law enforcement, there are standards which say that if it's a non-lethal action, then the response should also be non-lethal. It should not cross the threshold mm. of lethality. Uh, it all depends on the rules of engagement, which are the instructions given to these uh, units mm. on how they should respond to specific actions taken against them. But self-defense definitely will, will involve uh, probably some standards for what we call the graduated use of force. Mm. So there also has to be some actions that trigger uh, greater or uh, more well, reasonably greater response in order to prevent no, a perceived... Uh, no. uh, yes, but then that also means we, we should bring pickaxes, perhaps. Oh, okay. no? And, 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 and international law will allow for that? Yes, yes, because again, the standard is simply proportional and reasonable. Mm. And here, if a pickaxe is being used uh, and you do believe that it's about to cause serious injury or death, then that's the time that a lethal response may be warranted. It all depends on the situation. Okay, Attorney, real quickly, in line with that, a lot of uh, analysts that we have talked to also, one of their suggestions was to use the MDT to request for uh, U.S. patrol boats to escort the RORA missions in order to ensure success. Now, in the spirit of the escalation, which we're is where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that suggestion? Would that be inflammatory? Would that be a good idea? Would that be a better idea than uh, going hand-to-hand -hand combat? Uh, perhaps it would, uh, but I think the policy of government right now is uh, to avoid that because it's, it might present an image of uh, weakness or mm. lack of determination. On the other hand, it is something that China, al China will absolutely hate to happen, so maybe that is the, <laughs> that is, uh, well, the route to take if you want to piss them off in a real. Your thoughts on Senator Amy Marcus's uh, uh, mm. hypersonic yeah. missiles? That, that China <laughs> is aiming to target us with hypersonic missiles. 25 targets uh, mapped out in the Philippines. Uh, alarmist speculation meant to induce panic, I think, because hypersonics are not meant for those types of targets. I mean... China already has the Philippines, the entire Philippine range, uh, within range of its short range and medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles. They don't need to use hypersonics mm -hmm. against us. And in addition, since 2017, about uh, a third of the Philippines is already within the range of missiles from their artificial island bases. Mm -hmm. So, so they don't it yeah. doesn't matter whether there's a hypersonic or not. It's superfluous. <laughs> they don't need to waste their hypersonic yeah. missiles on us. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we are going to have to leave that there for tonight. Thank you so much for all your insights. Very enlightening. Dr. J. Professor, Attorney J. Batumbaka, Director of the UP Institute of Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea.
Lots to digest, but we're going to be pausing for a quick break right after that. The Liberal Party begins hatching plans for next year's midterm elections, which may include some unlikely alliances. That and more when we return. Keep it here. So watching the big story here on One News. The Liberal Party is asserting its role as a true opposition and has revealed initial plans for the 2025 midterm elections. Here's party president Congressman Ed Seligman at the Kapihan sa Manila Hotel today. Panagay ko hindi kami maglalagay ng full slate na dose. Posibleng uh, a maximum of six. Sapagkat uh, alam ninyo sa opposition, uh, we are not going to spread suddenly our uh, uh, logistics. Sa ngayon, meron na yung apat na pwede rin pumasok, uh, dalawa pa ang uh, pwedeng piliin, at marami pa ang gustong sumama. Congressman Lagman did not disclose who the four initial bets are, but he did say that he is not one of them. Earlier this year, Liberal Party spokesperson Laila De Lima named former Senators Kiko Pangilinan and Bam Aquino as well as human rights lawyer Chel Diokno as the party's initial candidates. But both Diokno and Pangilinan told us here at The Big Story that they were still weighing their options while Aquino went in a different direction, heading up the newbie political party Katipunan ng Nagkakaisang Pilipino or KANP. When asked whether they are still wooing former Vice President Lenny Robredo, Lagman had this to say. Alam ninyo na meron ng uh, disclosure kung ano ang sa kanyang preference. Pero pinag-uusapan pinag pa rin namin na sumama siya. Pero uh, we will respect her preference. When it comes to alliances, the Makabayan bloc said they're open to teaming up with the opposition for next year's polls. Lahat no, kinakausap. Kasa, Siyempre kasama yung uh, uh, Liberal Party kasi marami rin kaming mga, uh, mga parehas na o oh, magkakatulad na mga, ano, no, na mga issues na tinitindigan. Yun po yung kulang ngayon. Ang choices mo, Marcos, Duterte, hindi yun ang gusto ng makabayan. Tunay na oposisyon ang gusto ng makabayan bloc. Kung kaya po, open kami doon sa pakikipag-usap ng mga tunay na oposisyon. Lagman says the Liberal Party is also open to alliances, but will it consider teaming up with the administration? Lagman had this to say. For electoral purposes, I think the Liberal Party will remain as the political opposition and will put up its independent slate. But for on issue to issue basis, there can be an alliance. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, with respect to the West Philippine Sea, with respect to the ICC, then we can have uh, uh, an alliance if the government will change its posture that we should uh, cooperate with the ICC with respect to the uh, uh, charges against the former president on alleged uh, crimes against humanity related to the drug war. All right, bringing it to the Senate where the clash between Senators Nancy Binay and Alan Peter Cayetano have gone viral for all the wrong reasons and it has overshadowed some critical points in the review of the new Senate building in Taguig. Man Los Banos with the report. Chairman, Chairman, uh, yes. ano lang po, po uh, pwede po ba <coughs> i-move na lang po natin po, suspend the, okay lang po ba, suspend na lang po natin. Tatapos na nga tayo eh, gusto ko nga tapusin para nga mag-usap after, so I don't know, I want to give Senator Nancy all the chance rather than press con siya ng press con, kaya lang, hindi ko ako press con ng press con, uh, napipilitan lang po tayong sumagot, kasi nga ho, mali-mali yung mga, that was Senator Robin Padilla's attempt to defuse the tension in the room after the heated exchange between the former and incumbent heads of the Senate's Committee on Accounts. 
Senators Nancy Binay and Alan Quetano had been butting heads over the construction of the new Senate building in Taguig City. The clash between the two senators overshadowed some of the key issues and concerns over the new Senate building. Aside from construction delays, one other factor that may have caused the budget to balloon was the revisions in the design plan. The DPWH presented approved variation orders for the project which amounted to over 500 million pesos. The Senate would also be spending quite a lot on architecture at 3.1 billion pesos and on landscaping at over 600 million pesos. I've never seen 600 million landscaping for a building on a, ano, ha, on a pastry. <laughs> na meron pang, medyo, ano na to, ano yung sa Singapore na may garden sa loob ng garden by the base na to. Binay is now considering filing an ethics complaint against Cayetano. Senate Majority Leader Francis Tolentino, who chairs the Ethics Committee, had to step away for a moment when his two colleagues were bickering. Tolentino said he regrets leaving the hearing early. He said he would have intervened, called the hearing to order, and moved to strike unparliamentary remarks from the record. Tolentino said he will immediately tackle any ethics complaint filed by either Binay or Cayetano. In a statement, Binay also said she's not expecting an apology from Senator Cayetano for what she called pambabastos. She called this behavior very unbecoming of a senator, especially a senior one at that. Their fellow senators, meanwhile, are hoping that the two will be able to settle their personal issues as soon as possible. Reporting for News 5, Mean Los Baños, we are One News. Senator Wynne Gachalian has issued a clarification on the Alice Go case. He says she can't be a state witness and testify against suspects involved in illegal pogos. Some news outlets had previously reported that she could be a state witness based off an interview he gave our sister channel 1PH. But Gachalian says this isn't possible as Go herself is deeply involved in the operations of the raided pogo hubs in Tarlac and Pampanga. Si Alice Go ay nasa gitna ng maraming mga pogo na ginagawa dito sa ating bansa. Sa, yung sa Bamban, lumalabas na siya ang naging applicant. Siya ang uh, naglakad ng papeles. Ultimo, pati uh, kuryente at tubig ay nakapangalan sa kanya. Kaya makikita natin na sa may direktang kaugnayan dito sa mga uh, sa, sa Pogo Hub. Go has been summoned to attend the next Senate hearing on the matter set for July 10. Her legal team says they will urge her to attend, though they claim even they do not know Go's whereabouts. Ah, hindi niyo po makonfirma kung nasa bansa pa ang inyong kliyente o hindi? Hindi kasi hindi. Wala pa kami na meeting eh. Mm -hmm. So, pero ako, I, I believe na dito siya kasi cellphone naman ang nag-uusapan na. Still in politics, but over in the United States, President Joe Biden has made it clear that he is absolutely not pulling out of the White House race. Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris joined a, an old staff campaign call and pushed back that mounting pressure for the 81-year-old incumbent president to bow out. This comes after a shaky debate performance last week that has thrust his campaign into chaos. But a new poll from the New York Times and Siena College revealed that Trump has widened his lead in the race. It showed Trump ahead of Biden among likely voters by at least six percentage points with 49%. This is Trump's largest lead in a Times-Siena poll since 2015. This poll surveyed 1,532 registered voters from June 28 to July 2 and found that large chunks of every demographic said Biden was just too old to be an effective president. Another quick break for now. Right after that, the Agriculture Department is launching a large-scale trial of a program that aims to sell rice at 29 pesos a kilo. All the details when the big story returns. Keep it here. Back. You're still watching the big story here in One News. The Agriculture Department is set to launch a mass trial of the 29 peso per kilo rice program tomorrow at 10 locations in Metro Manila and Bulacan. This is all aimed at providing affordable rice to vulnerable sectors. 
In a press conference, DA Assistant Secretary Genevieve Guevara announced that the large-scale trial of selling NFA buffer rice stock will be done simultaneously in 10 Kadiwa sites. The 10 sites are located in the offices of the Bureau of Animal Industry or BAI and National Irrigation Administration in Quezon City, the Bureau of Plant Industry in Manila, the Food Terminal Incorporated or FTI in Taguig, the Philippine Fiber Industry Development Authority in Las Piñas, as well as in Kadiwa Centers in Barangay 167 in Caloocan City, Disciplina Village in Valenzuela City, Barangay Fortune in BF City in Marikina, and Barangay Minuyan Proper in San Jose del Monte, Bulacan. Each family can purchase 10 kilos of rice per month. The DA is aiming to expand the peso or 29 peso or P29 program to the Visayas and Mindanao in the coming months. There will also be a booklet to monitor the purchase of beneficiaries. In total, the P29 program targets almost 7 million vulnerable households as beneficiaries. Itong programa na ito ay matagal lang na plano. So this is not only for SONA. This will be a long-term program. And we are doing it on a series of trials para masigurado natin yung uh, nationwide na pag-implement uh, na to ay wala na tayong masyadong problema. So... Health Secretary Ted Herbosa says a new second-generation dengue vaccine could be approved within the year in a bid to address the rising cases of dengue this rainy season. This new vaccine is named Q-Denga and is manufactured by Japan's Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Herbosa says they applied for product registration last year, which means the FDA is likely to finish its research and approve the vaccine this year. At least 20 countries are already using Q-Denga, including Indonesia, Thailand, and Brazil. As of June 15, over 200 deaths and 77,000 dengue cases have been recorded in the Philippines since the start of the year. Well, he also did propose uh, renaming the DOH to Department of Health and Wellness. Which is not gaining a lot of traction online. People don't understand why you have to rename the department, but... Pero ano, kasi maraming doktor nagsasabi niyan eh. Parang you shift the focus from curing, curing to prevention. To preventative, mm -hmm. yes. I agree with that. I'm Di actually a big one. Hindi lang siya pakinggan. Tsaka hindi, I think it's more dough. like medyo out of touch. <laughs> dough. <laughs> dough, from dough to dough. Totoo naman. It's really wellness. out of touch. Ang daming problema na bansa tapos inaatupag natin. You know, parang kasi wellness Naming. is a, you know, as health mm -hmm. is a basic and wellness is kind of like, it's aspirational. Diba? Anyway. Well, Talking about another issue, let's go, uh, let's move on over to environment. Actor and environment advocate Leonardo DiCaprio has expressed his support for Masungi Geo Reserve and has called on President Marcos to step in and protect the conservation area. In an online post, Leo talked about the deforestation in Masungi, which he called a lush montane rainforest landscape and the efforts of local communities to restore the conservation site. He said that as wildlife numbers slowly increased, more have become involved in protecting the ecosystem. He goes on to say, Now this success is in jeopardy as the Department of Environment and Natural Resources threatens to cancel the agreement that protects this area from prolific land-grabbing activities. This cancellation would set back the success of an internationally acclaimed conservation effort and leave the area vulnerable again to mining, logging, and illegal developments. The Hollywood actor called on President Marcos to intervene and protect Masungi. He went on to say that conservation successes like Masungi serve as a reminder that the Philippines can become a leader in sustainability, ecotourism, biodiversity, protection, and climate action. In response to the issue, the DENR said, it appreciates the concern extended by international celebrities on the Philippine environment. However, no one is exempt from the law. The agency says the Filipino people own the area occupied by Masungi and the operation of the resort, including charging for day tours, meetings, and weddings, remains non-compliant with Philippine laws. The DNR immune to the charms of Leonardo DiCaprio. I know. No one is above the law. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if the president is immune to the charm. That's true. Tinag pa siya. Yeah. DiCaprio, guys, Lee, uh, you called him Leo. So, so our, friend, <laughs> our friend Leo well, had naman President Marcos. Diba? It's now in the hands of the judiciary. They have to decide because the DOJ has already spoken about mm. the legality of that agreement. Mm. 
there. from uh, from the previous DNR. Mm -hmm. But okay, there was uh, something on that screen. Yes, there is a big, big Gilas game happening right now on the back oh, of oh. another one. Well, July 4 is not just the Independence Day of the United States. Mm -hmm. It is also a day that will forever be etched in Philippine basketball history. Gilas Filipinas de defied the odds and pulled off one of the most improbable wins in the program's history, stunning world number six Latvia in Riga, 89 to 80, to open their FIBA Olympic qualifying tournament on a high note. Justin Brownlee came up big with a near triple double of 26 points, nine rebounds, and nine assists, while Kai Soto was also impressive behind an 18 point, eight rebound, and three steal game. Against overwhelming odds, Gila's men led by as many as 26 points before holding off a late Latvia rally en route to a rousing win that broke the hearts of the stunned Latvian crowd. The triumph marked the first time Philippines has beaten a European team in 64 years as the Filipinos look to end a 52-year drought to return to the Olympic men's basketball tournament. Now, as we speak, Gilas Pilipinas is currently going up against world number 23 Georgia, who is eager for a bounce back win after getting demolished by the Latvians by 28 points. A victory over Georgia would automatically put Gilas atop of Group A with a 2 0 win loss record. A loss, however, isn't the end of the world, as a defeat by less than 18 points will still put Gilas into the next round. Okay, we're looking at live pictures now, the live feed of the Gilas versus Georgia. And it again, they have to lose with less than 18 points. Yeah, basically, if uh, if they do not lose mm -hmm. uh, by more than 18 points, then they are still through to the next yes. round. Right, still through to the next round. That's uh, Gilas head coach Tim Cohn. You know, I didn't. I wasn't sure though what to expect last night. I I did watch the game live. Mm -hmm. I slept at two thirty. It ended around two thirty. I missed the third quarter because I had to go out for a bit. But I mean, it was it was so shocking. This is the world number six. We haven't be beaten a European team, as Gretchen uh, reported, since in sixty four years. So pretty crazy win, pretty crazy performance um, by Justin Brownlee and Coach Tim Cohn. And of course, Twitter is all a buzz over that. But you know, the I am a Latvian coach Luca mm -hmm. Banchi. Is that Banchi? Bianchi uh, was quoted as saying that he was impressed with the triangle offensive for uh, that coach Tim Cohn had uh, put together, proving mm -hmm. that the triangle offense can still work mm -hmm. even though the the play is now more uh, faster. Right? It's dominated by fast-paced plays. He says that it's a uh, it's a it's, it's, a, it's a good strategy. I'm going to mm -hmm. interrupt you though, Reg, because uh, we are already watching and we are actually playing the Philippines but versus down. Georgia game. We are down 20 points right now. We are still in the second quarter. So there is still a big chance and a long game ahead. There's still seven minutes in the second quarter. But we are down 20 points and we need to lose by less than that. But I'm going to ask Coach Tim Cohn because of how he has... Uh, um, been able to make this team gel mm, well together very cohesive. with the leader uh, in Justin Brown Lee. Of course, Kai Soto performing mm -hmm. very well for the country with 18 points. Um, nga, no? Kasi parang in the past, we've been struggling, but uh, it seems like uh, we have a, a a team that's been together uh, for for longer, mm -hmm. and hopefully, this uh, the confidence brought about by yesterday's win will carry on over to this game. Yesterday, we led the whole time, uh, leading as much as 26 points. Pero ngayon medyo down tayo. Uh, pero natalo naman ito. You know, ito last night ano. though, I, I am gonna say, Gresh, I was watching the game, and by the end, they looked uh, pretty tired. Mm -hmm. Only to find out that in less than 24 hours, they they have another game. This one against Georgia. Now, uh, Georgia, people didn't really think they were such a big threat as compared to Latvia, who is ranked number six. But as we can see right now, it's not the best start for Gilas Pilipinas, but it's still before halftime, so anything can still happen. And the goal, of course, uh, of this is to be able to claim a spot in the Paris Olympics. Oh, uh, um, sinasabi ni Coach Tim Cohn, the goal here is not just to win one game, but to get to the finals mm -hmm. and see what would happen. That's definitely a tough road ahead, but our spirits are with you guys there. Here uh, is Gilas. hoping Coach Tim's 
triangle offense comes through again. He has said it was a very efficient offense system, offensive system that they put put on for the game against Latvia. All so the, here's we need hoping. All the good juju that we can get. But at the same time, as Sean pointed out, it was it's the second big game in less than 24 yeah. hours, yeah. less than 48 hours. Less so than 24 hours. Because the game, I was watching That's it. last night. Finished yeah. late last night and right. then again tonight. Right. So yes, actually, if it's, you're thinking Philippine strictly, time, strictly it's all within the 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. well, no, that's a lot. That's a lot. Right. Okay, so we'll let you guys catch the rest of that game. But that's it from the three of us here tonight. We are one news, all sides, all the time. Thanks for tuning